In podcast episode number 59, I talked to Philip Streif about separating facts from fiction around scapular dyskinesis. Philip is a sports physiotherapist and professor at the Department of Rehabilitation Sciences and Physiotherapy at the University of Antwerp, Belgium. According to Expertscape, he is the number one shoulder researcher worldwide. He teaches shoulder courses nationally and internationally and has created an online course together with us called Rotator Cuff Related Shoulder Pain, Separating Facts from Fiction. We started out by talking about the different terms that relate to deviations of the scapula. The leading term nowadays is scapular dyskinesis. The term six scapula encompasses scapular misalignment and scapular dyskinesis, but also includes pain, which is often not the case, as we will learn later on in the summary. According to Philip, the term should be abandoned due to the fact alone that it can cause worry in patients who think that their scapula is sick. Philip explained that most definitions focus on winging, so when the medial border of the scapula detaches from the thorax, or tipping, when the inferior angle of the scapula lifts off. Furthermore, the subjective observation of a non-smooth movement of scapular upward or downward rotation is also described as scapular dyskinesis. Next, we talked about normal movement of the scapula in relation to the humerus. Philip pointed out that 3D arthrokinematic studies show that for every two degrees of glenohumeral abduction or flexion, the scapula upwardly rotates one degree. There is no setting phase like assumed a few decades ago. After 90 degrees of elevation, the scapula tilts posteriorly about 10 to 15 degrees. It also internally rotates, so it detaches from the thorax. If we move into abduction beyond 90 degrees, the scapula has a tendency to externally rotate, so it moves towards the thorax. Our next topic was the prevalence of scapular dyskinesis. Surprisingly, meta-analyses calculated an average of 48% in the healthy population, which is surprisingly high. In patients with shoulder pain, it's a bit higher with 60%. In general, it appears that people who sustain high loads on their shoulders display scapular deviations more often. This is true in overhead athletes, but also in office workers. We then moved on to one of the big discussion points regarding scapular dyskinesis. Is it a risk factor to develop shoulder pain or not? Philip explained that we have data from seven prospective cohort studies and two systematic reviews with meta-analysis performed in overhead athletes, including volleyball, badminton, handball, and tennis. And the overall evidence is quite strong, showing that scapular dyskinesis does not predict shoulder pain. However, two other studies that Philip mentioned show that scapular dyskinesis combined with a fast increase in training load did seem to pre be predictive of shoulder pain. Philip's hypothesis in these cases is that the scapula is trying to help the overloaded rotator cuff and is thus showing signs of dyskinesis. Even though scapular dyskinesis assessment is under debate, we still talked about ways on how to assess it. According to Philip, we should keep it as simple as possible. He recommends visual observation, rating the presence of scapular dyskinesis as yes or no in shoulder flexion to maximal elevation. Secondly, corrective tests such as the SAT or SRT, if positive, can give an indication that there is an issue with the cuff and not the scapula and that strengthening the cuff can have a positive influence on shoulder pain. Third, he recommends simple strength testing for the trapezius and serratus, for example. We also briefly talked about the validity of scapular dyskinesis testing in comparison to 3D tracking systems. Philip explained that the gold standard of 3D tracking is problematic as patients often move differently when they are attached to wires and being watched. The classical bone pin systems have limitations as well, as the bone pins can cause pain and the skin is fixated as well, so the scapula cannot move freely. 
Our next big topic was therapy and its influence on scapular dyskinesis, which was part of Philip's PhD years ago. His team came to the conclusion that scapular-focused exercises did not change the movement of the scapula, but it still made patients better. The reason for this, according to Philip, was mainly that these exercises were excellent rotator cuff exercises, which were loading the cuff much better than usual care. EMG studies performed by pioneers like Ann Coles or Ben Kipler should be interpreted with caution. He stressed that EMG only measures activity and not strength, so a muscle can be highly active but not strong or show low activity and be very strong vice versa. Regarding therapy for shoulder pain, he further explained that we should thus not focus on single muscles but on the three big muscle groups the scapular thoracic, the glenohumeral, and the humerothoracic muscles, which all work together as a team. We briefly covered rhomboid pain as a side topic. He described two groups who often show rhomboid pain. The first is patients who train a lot in the gym and who overload their scapular thoracic muscles. The second group is patients with shoulder restrictions, like in frozen shoulder. These patients overload their scapular thoracic muscles in an attempt to compensate for the restricted glenohumeral mobility. Like mentioned earlier, this could be proof that scapular dyskinesis might actually be an attempt of the scapular thoracic muscles to help the rotator cuff instead of the other way around. At last, we also talked about situations in which the scapula might not be moving enough, like in post-op situations. According to Philip, scapular mobilizations might be a way to get the shoulder moving in case active movements are not possible, such as after rotator cuff repairs or in patients who just got a new prosthesis. In summary, however, Philip stressed that there are other areas in shoulder rehab and assessment than a scapula that we should focus on, such as our communication strategy, to just name one. All right. So this was a brief summary of podcast episode 59 with Philip Streff. I hope I could raise your curiosity to listen to the whole episode and to learn more about scapular dyskinesis. If you would like to have more resources on this episode, head to physiotutors.com where you can download the transcript and infographic. And if you want to dive even deeper into the topic, make sure to become a Physiotutors member and to download our app to watch the upcoming masterclass with Philip on frozen shoulder. Philip also created an online course together with us called Rotator Cuff Related Shoulder Pain, Separating Facts from Fiction, which has received a lot of praise and only excellent reviews. So make sure to check it out if you want to improve your knowledge and skills in shoulder rehab. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in another video. Bye.